Um, I must say it's, it's quite an experience to be here. Um, I can imagine why for Jose there are a lot of emotions to see so many of you here. He's been working on the language for many years. Now here's the Elixir conference. Uh, others who are writing books are here and they also have some emotions, right? This is so good. The community is growing. I was born in Krakow. I live here. So it's also a special event for me to see so many of you coming to my home city. I'm very glad to well, host you in the city. So um, just to, to let you know, this is great to see you well, in my home city. I will give you a quick background of, of myself. Uh, when Joe started to work on the airline VM, I was six years old. I didn't know much about programming, computing, nothing. It was released as, as open source, as you know, and this was more or less the time when I uh, started to study computer science uh, here in Krakow at the local university. And when Erlang VM got sub support for the uh, multi core, multi CPU architectures in 2005, it happened to be also the year when I graduated and I joined Erlang Solutions. So for the last 10 years, I've been working at Erlang Solutions with Erlang, with Erlang VM on different projects in different roles. And I had a chance and pleasure to learn what features pay off, what, re what really matters in, in long term. And this is something I would like to share with you today. Because many developer conferences, like ElixirCon, they highlight features of the language, of libraries, of frameworks. Well, we are developers, so this is what we are interested in how to build systems. What is the computing model that the VM proposes? But if you look at it from a few years perspective, after development of the system, you also need to put it into production and then maintain the system for a year, maybe for years. Actually, typical life cycle of an airline system is not months, it's years. It might be slightly different for, for the Ruby uh, system, which is not necessarily run for many years, you actually want to iterate fast. And this is uh, what Ruby developers appreciate with Ruby on Rails and other frameworks. So this might be that the Elixir use case for the airline VM is also leaning towards being able to iterate fast. But at the same time, you're coming to the airline VM ecosystem because of reasons. And I believe that some of those reasons is to have better life maintaining the system, which may live for years, maybe even 20 years. So if we look at it from this perspective, apart from, well, uh, as I said, paying a lot of attention to how we design and develop systems, we also need to think what will be my life in one year time or somebody else's life in a one year time. So. I have a few slides now where I try to highlight the features that you have already learned about or you have heard about over the last two days. And I'll try to give you some rationale. So in long term, why does this pay off to have those features? OTP behaviors. Um, well, we know what those are, design patterns, uh, where you have some generic parts abstracted away, like uh, well, client server, application release, what for? In long term, long term it's, it <coughs> helps build consistent maintenance procedures. If the whole system is built on top of OTP principles, you can have those consistent procedures, which will restart the system the same way, distribute, upgrade the system the same way. When we heard a talk today about like, upgrading live systems, this would not be possible without having all processes in the system, all applications in the system, built on top of the OTP principles. And as we have seen also, the systems are distributed as one tarball artifact. So in my next slide, I, I just, I'm referencing to some uh, Erlang workshop I have on my GitHub account, but this is the same experience you will have with Elixir. That at the end of your development cycle, that is, some build tool, build machine will spit out a tarball, a tarball, and this is what you install. It contains everything it needs. 
You can see here, it has the b binaries, the runtime system, some bin start scripts, and all the libraries. So this is very useful for operations of those systems. Another set, robustness. So we talk about uh, fail fast or let it crash and then uh, program for the correct case, so avoid defensive programming and so on and so on. Why? Because those systems indeed are <coughs> resilient to bugs. So it does not mean that they do not have bugs, they do. But they are more resilient to those errors conditions. And it's not uncommon to see system running with like reasonably good service and health. And when you look under the hood on your logs, things are crashing. Things are going really bad. But the experience of a user, of, of the, someone monitoring the system is like, no, it's all good, it's all there. But it keeps restarting, it keeps crashing, and you don't even notice. So this means resilience. It doesn't mean no bugs, it means just that you can survive, of course, you need to monitor, you need to <coughs> capture those cases. But it's not gonna bring necessarily your system right away down. So supervision trees, I believe most of you already know the overall idea of a supervision tree. I can also see very interesting development within the Elixir community of bringing new OTP behaviors that um, have not only gen server, but also the task behavior, the agent behavior, and other behaviors. This is all good. However, there's one thing I would like to highlight here. The supervision tree <coughs> is the principle of building those resilient systems. So no matter what your behavior is about, what new abstraction it brings to the table, remember to hook your processes into the supervision tree. If the process crashes, you don't want to miss this fact. You want somebody in the system to get exit signal, as we call it. So some notification, something happened. And the other way around, which is equally important, if you have a process running in the system and your father or your grandfather has to shut down because of some restart strategy, you need to be able to get hold of this process. In other words, without linking any process in the system into the supervision tree, you will lack this opportunity to shut down everybody gracefully, to get hold of everyone in the system. So in other words, I very much like that there are some new design patterns being captured and, and implemented by the Elixir community, which is great. We need to stick to some principles, OTP, OTP principles here, and I think supervision tree is really the, one of the most important ones. When in a few months' time you get to connect to your airline node and there are some processes hanging, like zombie processes, this is not something you want to well, end up with. Then we have distribution. Um, it was said today that uh, in some environments, maybe Elixir distributed system is not necessarily built on top of Erlang distributed protocol, you may need some other external components like Redis or other things. And that's true. But the uh, distribution that is built in into the Erlang VM also brings us some goodies. For example, we can connect to running nodes when, once we are live. And I don't mean connecting to them over a Unix pipe, so like be physically present on the box on which the system runs but we can connect to them over network. And we do so, for example, for maintenance of that node. So we call it sometimes the remote Erlang shell or remote Elixir shell. What it means is that you spawn a new Erlang VM instance just for the sake of running some shell or some maintenance tool which connects to your Elixir node over Erlang distributed protocol. And now you can do the same things as you would typically do if you would start your interactive elixir. So this foundation is used for building interesting observation tools. 
which are very easy to use. You just need to know the cookie of the Elixir node and you're good to go. Well, again, assuming you have access to that VM, to the necessary TCP port or the SSH uh, terminal. The way it works is that, as probably most of you already know, is that we have a full mesh of TCP connections between any nodes in the system. Assuming you have some nodes, each square in this picture represents an Erlang system, an Elixir node. They are connected in pairs, as you can see, so they know it about each other. The moment you connect cat with a dog, they start to gossip around other known nodes. And so that, as a result, we will get a full mesh of connections. In other words, once you have connected your observation tools, some other maintenance tools, to one of the nodes in your cluster, you already get hold of all of them, right? This is not bad. We need to be careful whenever we build big clusters because this uncontrolled connection or uncontrolled creation of full mesh may be actually the bad thing. But as long as we are not building huge Erlang clusters, Elixir clusters, this is a bliss. You connect to one of the nodes and you already get, can get hold of any other node in the system. And so that you can yeah, indeed reach any one of them. Now, so as a result, a number of tools are being built that leverage this Erlang distributed protocol. I believe you have used the Linux or Unix pop command every once in a while. You connect to a Linux box and you want to check what's going on. So which process consumes most memory or, or which <coughs> process is busy at the very moment with some computing. So this is quite well understood and everybody knows why you would want a tool like this when you connect to a Linux box. A similar tool can be built for Erlang or Elixir node. We get to see all the Elixir processes running and we also can sort them by number of reductions which somewhat translates to how computing intensive operations this one is executing uh, or memory or message queue size or any other things. The tool I'm presenting here is uh, NTOP. This is not part of the standard OTP. It's uh, an open source contribution. There's also ETOP as part of the standard OTP release. So those tools are, have been built. There are even uh, top-like tools for web or WX widgets. What I'm saying here is that they all leverage the Erlang distributed protocol. This is a very powerful thing to have. And then hot code loading. Um, I've been working with systems of different size and frankly, updating system, live systems with hot code loading is not something that we spend a lot, uh, that we do very often. The reason for this is that despite all the excellent features of the VM to support this case, and OTP can also support this, it takes extra testing extra time of development and testing. So we always have to ask ourselves a question. If you have 10 Amazon instances on which you run your system, does it really make sense to put extra development time to ensure that all the live hot upgrades work or not? Or maybe it's just easier to indeed redirect traffic to some half of the system and then bring down half of the system, bring it up again with new version. So I think here the hot code loading feature, although it is being advertised as useful for live system updates, has to be always carefully considered. What is the associated cost of the development of such upgrade package? So, but well, it, this has been used for hot code loading uh, fixes. For example, I remember quite a few systems with 100,000 users connected and we did not want to disturb this system. Yet we had some very small fix that we knew tested and it was worth just hot code loading this patch. I'm not recommending this because again, having consistent upgrade procedures is what I would bet on. But 
using hot code loading production system does happen. The other use case for hot code loading is the shorter development cycle. This is actually something that I do benefit every day from. So the Elixir R command in your shell ju just reloads the module. So when you work with Phoenix, uh, as we have seen today in the morning during the keynote, um, <coughs> there's some extra b features built on top of the uh, well, web framework that also allows you to reload the web application in the browser. But the same applies to the live reload of your Elixir code. This really does shorter, shorten the development cycle. And this, this is something that you can benefit from right now. I would recommend to, uh, to take advantage of this feature. You don't need to restart the whole system to see the effect of your just committed change. Then another feature, tracing, which is built into the Erlang VM. Tracing which can be turned on and off. So this is good. It can be turned on and off while the system is running. It can trace function calls, message passing, garbage collector events, scheduler events, some other events. What it means in practice? In practice it means that first we had the chance to do live debugging of a system. And believe me, if you have a system running and something is going wrong for one user, and then you go there and you try to figure out what happened, so for the first you do is probably check logs, and then you realize, ooh, but I don't have printout or log or something put in this branch of my code. At this point of time, what do you do? Well, instead of recompiling the code to put more instrumentation to the source code, we can actually turn on tracer on the live system. And as long as we, we are carefully narrowing down the scope of tracing, by which I mean you can be very precise which process you want to trace, which module or functions from that module you are interested in tracing, or even what exact parameters you are interested in, and like forget about any other function calls. So you can be very precise and this way narrow down the events you want to trace. You can turn on tracing and immediately get feedback So what is going on with your system right now. This does have a little bit of an overhead, but not much. I will explain on my next slide. But I, I would like to stop here for longer. Tracer, the way it is implemented in, in Erlang VM, I think is the only way to, de to debug concurrent systems. I guess everyone had a chance to use the standard debugger of any well, .NET or any other visual environment where you set the breakpoints and then you go through the steps of your code and then you can better understand what has just happened. But imagine you try to do the same thing with a massively concurrent system, like Elixir system. You have let's say even 1,000 users, just 1,000 users, and you want to set up a breakpoint. <coughs> you get 500 windows to look at. Impossible. With tracing, you can get almost the same understanding of what has just happened. So what function has been called, with what arguments, what did the function return? So the same information that you would typically find in a, in a visual debugger with breakpoints, you can find out from the tracing events that are printed to a file or to a shell. But this actually helps you trace and debug a concurrent system where having a breakpoint is a no-no because the default timeout in a gen server is five seconds. The moment you do a breakpoint somewhere, some other gen servers will be timing out soon, waiting for this guy to finish. Yeah. So in other words, it's not only about the feature of being able to trace live systems, which is nice, which you can turn on and off again, <laughs> but it's also about the philosophy of debugging, which is different compared to, let's say, the web browser, where you have 
well, breakpoint for your JavaScript code and you can then understand what has just happened. Yep, I promised to explain a bit more about how tracing works inside the VM. I borrowed the slide here from Mats. If you have no tracing enabled, the Erlang VM will interpret your code <coughs> operation by operation or in, you know, interaction by instruction. If you turn on tracing, effectively you replace one of those instructions with some extra jump which takes you, which takes the VM to some trace pattern matching and it will pattern match against well the event that the operation that it is about to execute. And then, well, depending whether this did or not trigger an event, you will continue with your instrumentation. So what I'm trying to say here is that this is not g having a huge overhead, well, unless you are generating thousands or hundreds of thousands of events, right? So it's, again, important to know your tracing tools enough to be able to narrow down the scope of what you want to trace. Otherwise, it will give you some overhead, but it's not going to bring you down. There are some um, libraries, tools, that have been built on top of the Erlang tracer that help you work with it. Here I have, well, an Erlang tool, but I believe similar tools are being built or have been built for Elixir already. Just to show you one red bug where you provide some pattern this is the first line in this code, which says, I am interested in tracing module lists, the function sequence seek from that module, which takes two arguments, and I want you to return also what the function returned. And then later, in the second line, I'm trying out this function call, and as a result, I got two trace events. One is when the function was called, and then when the function returned. Very easy and powerful. Other tools that have been built on top of Erlang Tracer. Um, flame graphs. There's another interesting project here. I'm, I'm just showing eFlame, which can produce you some um, frame graphs. And flame graphs try to visualize what is happening with the call stack over the time, right? So which is a typical call stack for a process. And thanks to tracing, you can also see this, this blue line, which is, so when does the process sleep? So where is the blocking call? Which when you measure your um, concurrency efficiency, if you, if you like, so how parallelized your code is, this might be very important to understand which processes wait for other processes and what is the reason? The reason is uh, sort of found thanks to the call stack, right? And so again, despite of what this particular tool does, I'm trying to show that having tracing, having distributed airline, all of this, this does help build you interesting instrumentation tools. After you work with the Erlang VM for, for years, um, and it's no longer about trying to understand the syntax or build tools or how do you deploy systems. Once you have all of this running, then you will start to ask yourself other questions. Why the system misbehaves here? Why it does not scale the way I would like it to scale? What is that the system actually does? And then you will start to dig into the Erlang VM behavior. This is, when you look at the Erlang mailing list, those are quite often questions. Why did Erlang VM behave this way or that way? And so I was experimenting with some different ideas how to help developers visualize, better understand what is going on. Probably the most obvious idea that comes to mind is, um, is using something like Wombat that has been presented yesterday or other similar tools where you just plot some metrics on the timeline, and then, well, it gives you some idea of trends, of the current snapshot of the system. Um, so I experimented with this a bit. Then the next idea is maybe we don't even need the browser to get the same information. So you could maybe just use some semi-graphics and just put it in the shell. So 
for some people, having a browser is a luxury. When they connect to some embedded devices or some remote systems, it's not always possible to even open the browser. So maybe tools of this kind will be helpful. This is, those are the ideas I'm, I'm playing with. Or maybe we need a completely new way of visualizing what the VM does. I had a chance to play around with another one where you actually use 3D view to visualize how processes are connected to each other or sending messages to each other, right? So what in this particular view, you actually get to see a ring, which is Elixir or Erlang processes passing a message in the ring. While this is not always obvious, when you look at a tracer or logger, what happens in the VM, when you look at such visualization, it might be much clearer. Quick, you can quicker understand what's going on. So what I'm saying here is that for me, being an Elixir programmer is a new experience. I've been learning Elixir. I had a pleasure to deliver the OTP Elixir tutorial two days ago. It's very encouraging to see the enthusiasm and also what new design patterns and new use cases the Elixir community has found for the Erlang VM. I'm thinking also how the Erlang community can help here. What is it that we can bring to the table uh, which would help you advance? And I think one of those areas is the understanding of the VM. So developing some tools that will help you even quicker understand what's going on. So provide you some um, yeah, expertise around the VM, which at some point of time, everyone will need when the system runs for months or even years. And this is the focus of, of my work now and in the coming months. That's all I had. So um, thank you. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them.